Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Virtual Insider Views. I'm Kate Marina, Associate Director of Membership at the San Diego Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Meet the Curator with Dr. Ladan Akbarnia. I want to give a special welcome and thanks to you, our Circle members, for being here with us tonight and for your support of the museum through your membership. Before I introduce our guest, a few housekeeping notes. To submit a question, click on the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen and a pop-up will appear for you to type your question. We'll be taking questions throughout the presentation wherever possible and we'll have some dedicated time at the end of the presentation for additional questions. To introduce yourself and say hello to your fellow viewers, click the chat button. When the chat box appears, select all panelists and attendees so everyone can view your chat. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our curator. Dr. Ladan Arfarnia is the newly appointed curator of the South Asian and Islamic art at the San Diego Museum of Art and a specialist on the art of medieval Iran and Central Asia. Her research projects and interests include cross-cultural transmissions between Iran and East Asia, Persianate drawings, the relationship between oral tradition and visual culture, and contemporary Middle Eastern art. She recently left the British Museum where she was curator and assistant keeper of the Islamic collections for almost 10 years and one of the lead curators for the Al Bukhari Foundation Gallery of the Islamic World, which opened in October 2018. She was a contributor to its accompanying publications and is now working on a book about Persianate drawings at the British Museum slated for release in 2021. She began her new role at the San Diego Museum of Art last October and has enjoyed adapting to a new collection and colleagues. Before lockdown, she opened her first exhibition at SDMA, Elephant in the Room, Indian Paintings from the Edwin Binney Third Collection. Before going to the British Museum in 2010, she was Hagop Kevorkian Associate Curator of Islamic Art at the Brooklyn Museum, where she organized a reinstallation of the Islamic collection and the exhibition Light of the Sufis, The Mystical Arts of Islam, with its accompanying catalog in 2009, sorry, 2009 and acquired the collection's first works of Middle Eastern contemporary art. Previously, she served as the executive director of the Iran Heritage Foundation, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the preservation of Iran's culture and languages, and as consulting curator for the Aga Khan Museum Collection. She received her PhD from Harvard University. Ladan, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and put the, my PowerPoint on, and please forgive me if I have some technical difficulties just because I'm an art historian and it goes with the territory. Uh, and, um, and some of you I've met before, I think I'm sort of doing my round of meet the curator, you know, I'm um, introducing the curator and I, I think we're gonna be rounding on this October soon and I won't be new anymore. So I'm enjoying this, you know. In Iran, when you're a bride, you're a bride considered bride the whole year. So um, I'm just gonna enjoy that. So I'd like to thank, um, thank you, Kate, for organizing this. Uh, and thanks to my colleagues at the museum as well. Um, I know some of you are watching this evening. Thank you. Um, it's always harder to do these Zoom um, events because I, I depend so much on the energy of people. Uh, so what I'm going to, I asked Kate if she wouldn't mind when, if you have a question or if you're thinking something as we're going along, um, if she thinks that it's a good place to, to just pose the question, then I will definitely do my best to answer it. And I might feel that you're right there and you know you are there, but I just don't see you. Um, and also if my family is watching, my kids are over with my parents. So I just wanna say a special hello to Luca and Mila for watching. All right, so why don't we go ahead and start. Um, today I'm going to, I think you've seen in the announcement for this evening that um, tonight was going to be about uh, a focus on one or two works from the Elephant in the Room exhibition, which is, uh, it, well, which is not currently on view. It's, uh, they're on display, but not on um, view to us right now. Um, hopefully, when, once the museum opens, you'll be able to have a chance still to see, to see this um, installation. And um, I, would, I meant to talk about one or two works from that, but then when I was putting the presentation together, I just felt like there's never really been an experience, um, an, a chance for me to walk through the show with you, which I would have done, uh, and, or to be able to just talk to you while uh, walking along through that gallery. So instead what I've done is a, I've done a little overview of it and I will take a little more time with um, one of the paintings, one or two paintings. And then we're gonna have a future uh, project sneak peek. Um, and I'll, of all the different projects that I've been um, 
very lucky to be involved in since I've arrived. Um, I'm going to focus on one. Uh, and I think you, I hope you'll be ex as excited about it as we are at the museum. So let's start with the elephant in the room, uh, Indian paintings from the Edwin Binney III collection. This uh, is the space in the museum that's normally dedicated to displaying works, um, about 1500 works from Edwin Binney III's collection that was uh, donated either as gifts during his lifetime, especially in the 70s or in um, after he died uh, and, and, I th and in, in the 90s. And so we've um, really been able to share with the public a whole history of uh, South Asian painting, of Persian painting. And so for this particular show, when I, uh, I decided to focus on the theme of elephants, and I think it's, um, it's a nice playful theme. And uh, I've chosen one work from, from the exhibition. You're looking at the introductory panel of the exhibition. Um, and our graphic designer did a great job, you know, playing with the trunk of the elephant in the, between the L and the P there in the graphics. Um, and then on the left, there's a, you have the, an image of um, a female keeper, a mahout, uh, riding an elephant, but most likely she's, a, she's uh, someone of high standing just because of the clothing and the, um, the jewelry she's wearing, her embellishments. So it's almost as if the elephant is taking us into this room. You can also see all of these works online. So I think Kate might try and give you a link to the page where you'll, you know, the page that I have a screenshot of. of. Um, and on that page, when you scroll down, you'll be able to, that text that you see, I will, um, I'll go over a little bit of right now, but it gives you the introduction to the show. And along the sides, you'll have, there's a podcast that focuses on one of the works and another one that focuses on a story inspired by one of the works, which um, inspired my um, five-year-old at the time to, to, write, um, to write a story about a blue elephant. And so you can listen to that, or if you have young children or grandchildren, they might enjoy it. So actually, before I go further, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the exhibition itself. So uh, the elephant is looking at, I mean, the, the elephant is looking, we're looking at elephants as, you know, in terms of how they've been valued in South Asian culture and visual culture. Um, and so I wanted to start the show by talking about, you know, where does this come from? How, um, what is, what's the history of this? And what is it grounded in? And in Sanskrit poetry, uh, people and elephants are believed to live harmoniously in a shared natural world, um, where elephants actually enhance the uh, the aesthetic pleasure of the landscape by augmenting the human senses. And in fact, um, throughout history um, in South Asia, elephants were valued for their might, for their power, their grace, um, and they embodied um, royal power. They were associated with, um, with gods, um, kings and deities alike. And on earth, they were intimidating uh, animals. They, they could help you when you were um, going to battle. Um, they terrified uh, the the enemy um in they were even used as executioners so and there are stories actually also about the their senses the their i guess their their empathy or the their sense of um of even um the human the human mind because if they sensed there's a the, the legend is that if they sense that somebody were not guilty or were not really um deserving of their execution they would just sort of walk away or, or just push them aside and actually not trample them, which is how they would otherwise kill them. So um, they also were revered um, as, as gods, like the elephant-headed Ganesh, god Ganesh, or admired as the god Indra's elegant white mount. Um, and there's a little image right here on this screen where you'll see um, that the god Indra and her uh, and his mount. And, you know, this, this show was basically inspired by this reverence. And so it, it gathers together works that were produced between the 16th century and the 19th mainly. Um, some, were, uh, some are part of uh, literary or narrative themes and some, are, um, some were conceived as individual portraits. And they range in um, subject matter, they range in regions of production. And so if you do have a chance to look online, you'll be able to see that whole, um, you can see where everything comes from. Um, and, and regardless, I think if you have a chance to go through them, you'll get a sense that they, there really is quite a range and that um, there is a real beauty to the elephant um, on 
several levels. So the exhibition is di um, divided into four parts, elephants in Indian literature, elephants in action, elephants, uh, like pr powerful processions is the third one, and then uh, portraits and preservation is, is the fourth uh, section of the show, show. So we're looking at the first section and a painting on the left in this um, installation shot. It's very small, but it's like a little jewel of an exhibition. And, uh, it's, and there are four and three pieces on the wall just opposite us, one of which is on um, shown at right, which is from the Ramayana. Um, so in this section, you, we learn that you know, for millennia, elephants have been, um, have been featured prominently in folklore and oral traditions. Um, and the paintings in this section illustrate versions of stories from the Bhagavata Purana, uh, which is uh, translated to the ancient tales of the Lord Vishnu. And I'm very sorry for my uh, bad pronunciation and the Ramayana, uh, the story of Rama. And both of these are sacred Hindu texts that were originally composed in Sanskrit. Uh, the Bhagavata Purana is a thousand years old with 18,000 verses of narratives that are uh, basic or interwoven about the Hindu deity Vishnu, his avatars and the lives of uh, those who um, devo are devoted to him. While the, Rama while the Ramayana dates to about 500 to 100, um, BCE with 24,000 verses. And that's about the, the life and adventures of Prince Rama, including the rescue of his wife Sita uh, with an army of monkeys. And Rama's featured in the painting at right. Um, I'm gonna focus on one of the paintings from this section, which is the largest of, of the group. Uh, the, the title for this is Vishnu Liberates Gajendra, the King of the Elephants. And um, this was uh, made in, um, in Mysore, India, uh, at the end of the 19th century, or it has been attributed, attributed to that. And it's, uh, it fo features one of the best known salvation stories involving the Hindu deity Vishnu. Um, and it's from the Bhagavata Purana. So this, as the story goes, while the um, elephant king Gajendra is um, going to get a drink in a lake, he becomes um, bitten by a crocodile. And I'm going to go here so that you can see the various details of this story a bit better. Um, as he, and you see in the center, lower center, here you see that the, the crocodile is holding onto his leg. And he, this actually, uh, leads to a, a struggle between these two creatures of about a, over a thousand years, where Gajendra is trying to free himself from the grip of the crocodile and he doesn't succeed. Other elephants try to save him. And I, I think that this may be him as well, um, because uh, this, the whole painting is conceived as a continuous narrative, which means that you're getting different parts of the story in the same frame. So if this is our main image, um, you see that he's been bitten here. You see um, other elephants trying to save him to no avail. And, I, and only until he has lost everything, you know, and it reminds me so much of the, the Sufi's journey and, um, and Sufism, which is um, very loosely put, a mystical branch of Islam. And it's only at, as he reaches his last breath that Gajendra then appeals to Vishnu, to his Lord, to save him. And at that point, Vishnu comes sweeping in you see him coming down through here, and he's usually recognized by his, um, by his attributes. He arrives on his Mani Garuda, who is right here, um, and he throws this flaming discus, or chakra, at the crocodile. And then if you look back at the center lower image, you see that it hits him and actually succeeds in, um, it, well, it ends up decapitating him, but here it's on his chest. And uh, now free at last, um, Gajendra learns that he's actually a reincarnation of the king Indra Dyumna, um, who'd been cursed to be reborn as an elephant, although he's reborn as a king. Um, and so now only having surrendered himself completely, um, and here actually to appeal to him, he is offering him a lotus. It's sort of a, it looks like it's wilted, but this is the stem of the lotus in the picture at right, between around his tusks and going up to another version of Vishnu here in blue. Um, but only now, having completely surrendered himself um, to Vishnu, the gender can attain um, the transcendent state of moksha, and that, and hereafter, he's he's referred to as Gajendra moksha. So, um, so it's great to start at the beginning of the um, show to to learn a little bit about these stories 
um, and which do feature elephants um, quite prominently. So we're going to move on to elephants in action. Um, so in this in this section, there were there were plenty of images, that, plenty of works in the collection that show elephants in action. We just didn't have space to show them all. But um, this with these three, I felt that we got a little glimpse into um, three very different ways of showing them in movement. So um, the one you see at right is the um, spectacle or sport of fighting elephants and elephants who you know, once they were trapped, so we have an image of that in the next slide, um, elephant trapping expeditions, they could be trained to, um, to be hunters and go on royal hunts with their masters or to end mahouts, or they could um, be trained to fight each other for entertainment. So this particular, um, this is one of my favorite works in the show. And I won't dwell on it too much because you can actually listen to me talk about it um, as one of the episodes for our Masterpiece Minute podcast, um, which I am not very good at bring, keeping down to a minute. So I, I will apologize in advance for that. But in th this particular one I chose because with every work that I usually choose and put in an exhibition, I really want, um, it needs to fit the theme of the exhibition, but I also want people to be able to learn one other thing. You know, so for this, this particular one, what was important to me about this work? Well, other than the fact that, you know, first it's just appealing, you know, just visually, it, I, in my opinion, one of the criteria is to, to create, you know, or elicit um, a sort of visceral reaction in the viewer. So with this particular one, it's, they look like they're happy and dancing. The writers don't look very happy. And there are actually texts that talk about, um, about uh, the wives of these mahouts or keepers when they were um, about to go fight um, at one of these uh, court spectacles or fights, um, they would actually go through the different um, stages of mourning and they would cry and, and you know, um, tear, um, they would just go through these motions because they didn't know if their, their um, husbands would make it. So, um, so that doesn't show so much over here, but you also, there's also um, a close connection that can be drawn to um, Iran and the Persianate world. And by Persianate, I mean you know, um, that the linking of all the areas, Central Asia, South Asia, Iran, that are, are linked by this, um, val this valuing of Persian language and culture. Um, so you would have artists that would flow back and forth between these courts, especially um, during the Mughal period, also um, in the, um, and the Deccan in the south. Um, so here, this kind of the kind of um, drawing that's shown here is called Nimralam or half pen, um, where it's very monochrome in ink and just gold, the use of gold, and then with color only used for embellishments. So here, you know, these are courtly elephants because of their ribbons and all of their accoutrements. And I've now spoken more about this than I should have. I can't help it. I love this piece. Um, but I love these pieces too, because they give you the other um, two types of movement I wanted to um, display, which was uh, showing uh, the capturing of a wild elephant um, and, and also um, Raja Ram Singh the first, who's spearing a tiger from the back of an elephant. Um, and you see his um, attendant um, helping him from behind with a rifle to, to shoot these gazelles. Uh, powerful processions is the third part of the exhibition and um, of this little show um, and you see it over here now what you can't see unfortunately is we also were able to put a little graphic of an elephant that's just kind of in gold kind of imitating the the gold that you see on the border of this work um, an outline looking like he's just walking along the wall um, and you know that was really with um, both with children in mind and just with just having a little playful element. So I hope that you do get to go in and see these things up close. So in this section, um, there are works that show um, royal figures, uh, um, deities as in the painting at right of Indra, which um, I mentioned the God before in the introduction. Um, this is another page from the copy, a copy of the Bhagavata Purana, but I felt that it fit in this section because it showed this procession. But we know that it's Indra, um, especially because we recognize um, Airavata, the, um, the mount of Indra, who is known to have multiple trunks and tusks. So elephants were known for um, being mounts to gods and royals, and they visually um, reinforce messages of power and nobility. And I mentioned how they, um, they were 
um, integral to, to war as well. Um, and the Indo-Persian poet, um, Amir Khosro de Lavi, who's known for his um, Hamse, among other works, a 14th century poet, wrote of war elephants that um, described them as a line of baneful clouds, each cloud with lightning to attack, swift like the wind. In its swift motion, each elephant like a splendid mountain, the armor upon it like a cloud upon a mountain. So in text, in, in images, uh, and in, in life, um, elephants held a very important role. This, this is another work from the section on the processions that I put up here. Now, some may think, okay, well, why is that up there? It's not very, um, you know, it's, it almost looks like a, like a study. Um, and it may well have been. Um, you can see where the page has been torn, where it was folded, which meant it probably went, it transferred hands quite a bit. And that's usually the kind of wear and tear you see in workshops. And, and they say something to us about workshop practices, about how uh, things were made. And what would be you know, another thing that's important in a workshop? You know, how do images get transferred? How are themes and motifs and subjects copied from one surface to another? Um, so personally, I'm very interested in drawing as a medium and having a value as its as its own in its as its own category. And but in in this case, you know, it, we see one of its roles as a transfer process. And the little dots you see in this detail are um, indicating a pounce. So pounce, for those who may not know, it is is a is this technique of poking holes into the original um, drawing or image, and then you would place that over a blank surface and then you would um, sprinkle charcoal or other kind of uh, material go th that would go through and then you kind of connect the dots. So the main areas would be pounced and you can see traces of that pouncing throughout this drawing. And in spite of the fact that it looks like it's unfinished, it, it, is, it is actually finished because they've highlighted certain areas um, and you really get the sense of dynamic energy. So coming to our last uh, section in this exhibition, in the last um, couple of slides um, on the elephant in the room. I call this section Portraits and Preservation um, because it includes portraits of elephants and albums, uh, mainly assembled in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and the Mughal Emperor, um, and also uh, we, see, we see like an example of what an album page would look like in, in the middle image right here. So this particular page, uh, this painting has been, um, dated to the late uh, 16th century. And it, for that, it, it's the oldest work in the show, um, dating to the period of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, Akbar the Great. Um, and we know that Akbar also um, had, you know, he did a lot of things. He had a lot of texts translated from, per, um, from per, um, into Persian and a lot of um, Sanskrit texts translated into Persian, disseminated throughout his empire, but he also, uh, liked to have images and portraits of the types of people and the, the types of figures that surrounded, that he saw you know, at court. And so you have these portraits that come start as early as his period um, and before Jahangir's period where we get an interest in um, the natural world. So in this particular painting, we have a, an elephant with a mahout and attendant but we don't have the actual princely figure. It's probably missing. But I liked this one because it also um, hints at the, this, the, the art of um, the book and book production. You see that usually this really is an, um, is an inspiration that comes from Persian painting and also, and also um, in Qurans, you'll see these cartouches where there would be a caption or there would be a title for, um, for a part of a story or in a Quran for um, the next chapter. Um, so in this case, um, I just um, also, you know, wanted to point out that, that both these emperors have these memoirs where we hear a lot about how many elephants they had. And this is why I included the quote from Jahangir, Akbar's son, um, also Mughal emperor, and the Mughals were um, an Islamic dynasty in India who saw themselves actually as the Timurids or even the Mongols in India because they traced them, their lineage back to both the Mongols and to um, the prophet. Um, and he apparently had collected um, over 11,000 elephants um, and showed his favor to some of them by, by actually um, giving, off, giving them, providing them with um, very luxurious trappings and their personal servants. Um, but, and I wanted to include the painting at right because it's such a change from what you see at left. In this case, this painting was also, um, it's, it 
came to us on a detached album page, but it's not at all um, Islamic or Persian in nature. It actually depicts the god of love, Kama, who's mounted on a composite elephant. And this, um, these composite animals are something that you do see it in Indian painting and also Persian painting, and they're, they're phenomenal. I, I love this one because it's so different than the Persian ones and other uh, Mughal ones or Deccani ones I've seen. Um, and it's built of seven dancers, seven female dancers. And I have to apologize that um, I did not, was not able to identify Kama um, when I wrote the label for it originally. So you might see on the online ex exhibition that it says it may be a god or maybe Krishna, but it's, it's definitely Kama. And I think um, Dr. Goswami went for, for um, identifying um, the god for me. And finally, just an example of how Elephants, when treated the same, looking in the same direction, same type of elephant, these are most of these elephants, all of these elephants in the exhibition are Asian, except for one, which you'll see next, and just see how differently the same subject is treated. On the left, uh, a work made in Rajasthan, um, and it, one of the areas where elephants were plentiful, um, and there's this very, these, this inky style of, of showing the elephant, um, and with color on the trappings, and then this more fuller, um, almost more naturalistic style that you see on the right that is more associated with um, the Deccan and again connections to Persian painting where you see the female Mahout. Um, and so the, these and also paintings from Kota region in general tend to be very large and, and have a, another kind of dynamism to them. And one of the last works in the exhibition, the last one is actually the blue elephant that my son talks about in his podcast, but this one I included because it was um, the only example of an African elephant that we had. And there are some texts that, um, th it's believed that this was one of the drawings that a, an Italian doctor commissioned when he was living in the Deccan. But he had actually spent time at the Mughal court up north. Uh, and he talks about two, at least two embassies that came from East Africa where elephants were brought as, um, as gifts. And so it may be that this was drawn from one of those embassies. And so that, and this, I've just included a detail here, to, again, to bring attention to the fact that this is a page that was in an album, that often in these albums, um, you'll see that the gutter is right here in the lower area, the border, outer border is up here. Um, but, if, but when I looked at this work with um, our um, associate registrar, Shira, um, this was the only, the only place you would see. And so I asked to have the window opened up on the mount so you could actually see how it was mounted into the album and then to see the gilding, the gilded drawing up close, even the drawing here, even this. And, and here, if you, some, that's where you can actually see how different pieces of paper are joined. Does anyone have any questions on elephant in the room yeah. before we move forward? This would be a good time for that, yeah. Actually, there's one question. Oh, what are the different sizes of albums and is the size significant to its purpose? The, can I just do this? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, this is this. So this is a letter size page. So um, when I was at, uh, so I was at the British Museum before um, coming, coming to SDMA. Um, and so I, I a lot of the part of the collection I looked after included albums and many of them from India. So most of them are actually quite big. I mean, they could be like this. Um, but then you might have some that are maybe this, this size, like some smaller ones. The images that you see probably came from that bigger size. Uh, and usually um, many of them, they follow this pattern of, you know, image, image, like uh, image, image, calligraphy, calligraphy. Often, often like 16th century Persian calligraphies. Um, many times by famous calligraphers, many times, um, you know, said to be famous calligraphers and, and they turn out not to be, but many times they are. So, uh, so I think the fact that they are that, that size, I mean, that would take, uh, they were meant to be, they were meant to be circulated in elite circles. You know, these are, and one of the reasons that we have them is again, because they, they were at these upper echelons of society. Um, and I should mention, and I really shouldn't mention this as a side, but um, to really acknowledge the way, the only, the reason that we have these, you know, their path is, is a very clearly colonial path. Um, and, um, and so one, one of the um, ways I'm also looking at presenting this collection in the future is as, as a room where we show um, works from this collection um, with, with much gratitude to the collector who who realized and knew 
all too well how important it was for these to be in a museum um, rather than be uh, uh, basically disseminated and, and, and split up and um, who going who knows where. But, um, but that the way they got here was a very, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems with the way they, they arrived. But um, as a result, we have lots of single pages because of the way they were sold. Sometimes we have pastiches of works that were just, you know, put together, especially in the 20s and 30s, like the, the first half of the 19th, uh, 20th century. Um, and and um, yeah, so some are bigger, some are smaller. The one, this painting is a very, very small drawing. So that was probably part of either a smaller album. Um, I haven't seen the album that this is associated with, with this Dr. Niccolo Manucci, but, uh, but that would be interesting to see as well. And often you can, you can find just by the, um, the, the trim of the frame, you can actually sometimes start to, to reconstruct uh, other elements of the same album be and because of studying them and seeing them in other collections. That is all our questions for now. Okay, so I guess we can move on to the next part. So I'm very excited to, when, when I arrived, um, I was asked to um, propose a special exhibition for 2024. And I'm very happy, uh, I was very happy to, well, I was, it was a challenge because when people think about Islamic art or Islamic visual culture, a lot of times people will think about, oh, you know, geometry or, um, you know, science um, is not, um, it's not something unusual, you know, to connect to, to Islamic culture. But um, one of the things I don't want to do is make it be um, a sort of stereotypical association. But there was this opportunity to, do, to, to propose an exhibition on, on the theme of science and um, Islamic art. And I went, and so I sort of thought about it and thought about it and it came up with this idea inspired by a, um, a text, um, a historical text. And so, and that is the text, uh, one of the texts that you see to the right. The show is called um, Wonders of Creation, Art, Science, and Innovation in the Islamic World. And so I'll give you a little overview. Um, but before I do that, I also have to say that the, one of the, the um, big, um, a, a very, very good piece of news that's going to allow us to really uh, propel the research for this exhibition um, is the fact that we recently uh, received news uh, of a very generous grant. Um, and I'm not uh, allowed to tell you what where the grant is coming from, but we will be able to announce that I think in September or at least early October. So stay tuned because then we can announce and, and give them credit for the support that they, they are already giving us. Um, but that grant will, will really support this, this exhibition um, in terms of research travel, in terms of um, creating an advisory board, having workshops so that we can really do our due diligence and vet um, ideas and, and scholarship and, and then um, also um, a research assistant to help with this. So this exhibition is going to, um, it's going to hopefully contribute to um, or look at the cont contributions of Islamic um, science to global civilization that resulted from intersection and continue to result from intersections of Islamic art, science, and intellect from as early as the seventh century when it's um, at the advent of Islam to the present day. Um, and there will be examples in the exhibition of uh, Islamic visual culture from Spain to Southeast Asia and the modern diaspora. And these will introduce new audiences to the diverse geographies and the multi-layered cultures of the Islamic world. One of the things that we tried to do in the Islamic, um, new Islamic gallery at the British Museum was to give people the chance when they walked in you know, to have a sense of, by the time they walked out, how complex and multi-layered, you know, is the Islamic world, which is really a worlds or cultures, um, really is, and that, um, and that it's a discussion for another day. The the choice of that terminology, um, but, but I really feel that um, a lot of times what we do is we have exhibitions that introduce, you know, Islamic art or Islamic geometry. I actually, I really believe that this show um, can have a great impact on. Um, not only other on, on the scholarship around Islamic science and visual culture, but also on the display of the kind of material that is truly global. 
Uh, and so it really should be able to be applied to, to any, any sort of part of the world and, and, and looking at these boundaries and blurred boundaries between art and science. So it's been inspired by these surviving folios of a well-known and widely translated um, text called the Kitab Ajaib al makhluqat wa Qara'ib al mawjudat which is translated to from the Arabic, um, Book of Wonders of Creation and Oddities of Existence. There's varied uh, translations of this. Uh, but basically it's a cosmology um, or a story, sort of origin story of the world that was composed in the 13th century by the Arab polymath uh, al Ghazvini. Um, and the exhibition will explore the transformative impact of, of science and technology on artistic production. You know, starting with that work and, um, and, and on the dissemination of this um, knowledge, both throughout the Islamic world, but also beyond it. And it will also show connections to, to other parts of the world, time before, areas around, you know, that were not Islamic. Um, and it's going to hopefully have an interdisciplinary approach that's inspired by current scholarship in Islamic visual culture. And you'll notice I'm always saying visual culture rather than art, because when you look at these works, I really think we need to you know, expand that vision because um, some works were not necessarily con conceived as art in terms of, as art as separate from uh, culture or material culture. So objects of daily life, objects that were um, beautiful manuscripts that were meant to be, um, were, were meant to just be you know, admired and, and held, they still, there's a very, there's, there was no distinction, um, especially like in the medieval Islamic world between you know, art and honar, and even in Persian now, honar the, is the word for art, but it's also the word for talent. So it's, it's uh, signifying both something, an action and a, and a product. So I think I'm gonna walk you through what I'm imagining this exhibition to be now. And since this is going to be recorded, let's all meet again in four years and see how, what I was able to actually borrow and if the narrative uh, re, you know, stayed loosely, you know, more or less as I um, envision it right now. Let's get some water. Okay, so I sort of picture walking into this exhibition um, through an introduction to these, to the Wonders of Creation text. Uh, and the, the idea is that, you know, you would, you would um, see, look at something like these beautiful opening pages to this text that um, belong to the Metropolitan Museum. And you would see, um, hold on one second, you would basically, uh, be introduced almost as though you're opening a book to be to to read and you know sort of immerse yourself in this story of science um, in the and the Islamic world, especially going into the first section. So, uh, if you this is actually these two pages were made in Iran and Shiraz, and it's very very typical to have for very um, objects of of high quality to have lots of gold and lots of lapis, which this, which this, or cobalt as well, um, which this book has. So in this introduction, it's almost like you're being introduced by opening, you know, you see those opening pages, which are actually produced later than the pages we see here, um, one of which was the title slide. And it's, it's almost your introduction into these wonders of human creation. And that was sort of the inspiration. I just thought, <clears throat> let's look at the wonders of human creation over the ages. And so in the first section, that, um, in this introduction, we we become introduced to the inspiration for the title of the show. And, and you know, it looks like we'll be able to borrow some important pages from this very, very famous copy of the Ajayb al Mahlugat, or the Wonders of Creation and Oddities of Existence, which has been attributed to Mosul in uh, modern day Iraq in, at the turn of the 14th century. This is uh, in the British Library. And because it's unbound, that will mean that it, it'll be much easier to borrow pages. And also if it travels to be able to, you know, insert other pages. But one thing that's interesting is you'll also see that this is very indicative of, of painting in those in those early in that early period. Our earliest illustrated manuscripts date to about like 13th and 14th century. Um, and here there's no depth in terms of the view, um, in terms of your perspective. Uh, you've got that straight line. And there's a lot of uh, inspiration that comes from classical painting as well. So that sort of brings me to this first part of um, the first section of the exhibition, which in some ways uh, feels like it right now, it's gonna be the largest. It's the most 
um, densely packed. Uh, because this one, which is right now being called at the intersection of art, science, and intellect, it's really about introducing um, historical content, context and introducing the many branches of Islamic science through, through the, the works, the objects, through the visual culture. So what are these branches of science? Medicine, astronomy, astrology, astrology philosophy, geography, alchemy, optics, um, geomancy, which is the occult sciences. Um, there's so many things that I don't even know the meaning of, and I'm learning so much about it right now because I haven't focused on it. And these would have been familiar to Muslim artists, poets, patrons, um, and also people who existed in those worlds that weren't necessarily Muslim. Um, scientists, philosophers, geographers, mathematicians, and other you know, quote unquote makers throughout history. And I um, have been very much inspired by the work of a, of a colleague, Blair Anderson, who's working on um, a monograph on uh, Ibn Firnas, who was this polymath at the um, court of the Umayyads in Andalus in Spain in the ninth century. And he was himself a polymath. He was a, 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 he was a poet. He was also a mathematician. He created instruments, scientific instruments for this court. And she's looking at him and this idea of um, scientists as makers. And so I'm very much inspired by that idea and by looking at um, the role of the people behind these texts, behind these objects. So on the left here, um, there's also particular figures that are very important. So on the left, um, in this first area, you'll, you'll have, you'll see, you know, calling it early interactions and conversations. This is the period we ha you have these phases of texts coming from classical, um, the classical world being translated, adapted, you know, mediated. And, and so um, this is where we become introduced both, first of all, to Azvini's text, which itself um, already, you know, t gives us a view into the universe and describes earth, plants, um, animals, fantastical creatures, other extraordinary marvels. Um, and then in, in the case of um, this painting at left, this is actually a translated, um, ver uh, translated um, copy of the Materia Medica of Dioscorides. So this was originally composed, a text uh, the text was originally composed in Cilicia by the first century BC, a BCE Greek um, physician, uh, Dioscorides. Uh, and so it's his medical treatise. And he, it was then translated from the Greek into Syriac uh, in the ninth century. And then later that same translator would edit another translation from Syriac into Arabic in Baghdad under the Abbasid dynasty. And that would be the form of the text that um, was disseminated the most. And that's the version that you have here. Um, and in, there will be these little bits, places throughout the exhibition where you learn about historical figures, um, either somebody like Ibn Firnas, who's a, um, a person who's, who we know of and is a, a real historical figure, or a type like the physician, because physicians were seen as this link between the celestial and terrestrial realms. And then on the right, you have this uh, page from, a, from, a, from an illustrated manuscript of um, al-Sufi's book of the constellation of the fixed stars um, from this was uh, dates to about the 12th century and and Mosul, which is currently Iraq. And this is one of the oldest surviving copies of al-Sufi's 10th century treatise, which purportedly advanced the second century discussions of Ptolemy um, in his Amal Guest. And this manuscript depicts most of the classical constellations in mirror image. Uh, and and so um, the other reason why this particular manuscript is, is important is because it is a full manuscript and also it was a subject of a large scale conservation um, within the last decade. And this would fit into the third part that we'll get to, which um, focuses on the science of conservation. We also have um, examples oh, of, um, hold on one second. We have examples of, um, different branches of science, as I mentioned. So I thought I would use this particular object from the British Museum. So I was telling Kate today that this object, you know, it's about this big, it has its own space, it gets its own case in the gallery, um, right next to, a, um, I think it's a case on, on not the sciences, but on um, and divination, or it's not called magic. But in any case, this is a geomantic in, um, instrument, and it's known uh, geom geomancy was known as El Malromi, the science of the sand. Um, and it represents as a science, a popular form of divination or you know, knowledge seeking 
from the supernatural. So um, it was also seen as, because of that, it was also considered an occult science by some. A geomancer would use an instrument like the one you see uh, to answer a client's questions about daily life or a more serious concern by randomly throwing grains of sand at the instrument. Um, and one of the objects, um, Arabic inscriptions reads, the judicious one hides his secret thoughts, but I disclose them just as if parts were created as my parts. Um, but I cannot tell you exactly how it's used. So don't ask me, Kate, because I know you watch it. <laughs> Throughout the show, uh, there will be opportunities to have um, what here I call intersecting interventions, where, because there are a number of uh, contemporary artists who are um, really fascinated by historical uh, texts, historical Islamic texts. Um, and so one of, just one of these is uh, a very talented artist by the name of Hav Kahraman, um, who is um, Iraqi American and is based in Los Angeles. And she has done work where she's looked at um, another text, uh, another well-known uh, medieval Arabic text. And she's, um, she's then taken her own ideas and brought and sort of shed light on issues that are important to her as an Iraqi woman and her um, upbringing, but also to, um, for women in general. And so I'm, I'm learning more about her now, but she's a, she's a very well-established artist. And I had heard, uh, you know, this is of course not at all, and I don't, I will not hold her to it because I haven't um, talked to her yet, but she does have, she seems to have an interest in the wonders of creation text. And if that's true, then it would be wonderful to engage her to do something where she, you know, creates works that, that bring, um, have a relationship to that. But going back historically, um, there are also other, um, other works that, that show, um, that take us back to other sciences like astrology, astronomy. Um, and in this case, um, this particular work was made for the Timurid prince Iskandar Sultan, um, and who was the grandson of the Turco-Mongol founder of the Timurid dynasty, Timur, who was also known as Tamerlane, um, who was, lived in the late 14th, early 15th century. And so there's a relationship to the Mughals here in India because of that Timurid line, that Mongol line. Um, and there were a series of, um, um, principalities that were ruled by his sons and grandsons after he died. They, um, and they really focused more on patronizing um, the smaller art, like objects, you know, versus lots of buildings as, as Timur did. But basically a lot of these princes, part of your princely education was also to, to um, um, learn about uh, poetry, become, to learn calligraphy, to learn, um, some were bibliophiles, some were interested in astronomy. Um, and so this, um, this basically, these, these lavishly illustrated folios belong to a section of a nativity book and horoscope that was compiled by uh, the prince's court astrologer and was once part of a larger anthology of contemporary texts that were housed in his library. So see, you can tell that it's courtly by how, you know, how richly it's been illustrated and it's a very well-known piece. And it, um, the horoscope itself um, represents um, Iskandar Sultan's intellectual interest in astronomy and astrology as well. Um, the other two works um, on that sort of relate to this topic, um, one of them is one of my favorite works uh, at the BM, uh, which is the Ulubeg Cup. It's known as the Ulubeg Cup and it's associated with the Timurid Prince Ulubeg, another one of um, Timur's descendants. And it probably was made in Central Asia in the 15th century. There's associations with China and the role of jade. Um, so it, it has an inscription naming the Timurid prince Ulubeg Kuragan, which means Ulubeg's son-in-law, which is the way that they connected themselves to the Mongol um, line and, and, and the date of his reign. And he was the grandson um, of, of Timur, but he was also a mathematician and astronomer himself. And he was so interested in the science, sciences um, that he, he was a great patron of both art and architecture. And he um, founded an observatory at Samarkand in um, Uzbekistan today. Um, and, uh, and he's, you know, he's based, this cup is really the source of the pride of many Uzbeks and it has, has received a lot of attention in our, in our collection. But um, later on, over time, that silver edition shows that it went into Ottoman hands because it's an Ottoman inscription and shows that, again, tells us something about the, the movement and life of objects over time and what they can mean. But he is definitely one of these historical figures to focus on throughout the exhibition because 
he um, had such an interest and has been so associated with uh, the science of astronomy. And related to that, you know, another nice thing I think to do in exhibitions where you're introducing people to a whole, you know, if not to a new topic, then to a new area, uh, is to also show uh, elements that maybe would be a surprise to be found um, in an exhibition on Islamic um, art. So this rare star map is, is distinguished by the unusual superimposition of 27 of the 27 lunar mansions in Hindu astronomy over depictions of the zodiac and constellations known in Western astronomy. And the printed star map tradition recalls um, Durer's, the, the um, North, Northern Renaissance artist, um, woodcut um, star images of 1515. And it alludes to the Jesuit missions that introduced European woodcuts and prints among, um, along with Christianity to Mughal India and contributed to this convergence of Christian, European, Perso-Islamic, and um, indigenous Hindu artistic traditions in India. It's also associated on stylistic grounds with India's great patron of astronomy. So after Ulubeg, the great patron from these parts uh, was the Maharaja Sawal J. Singh II, um, who reigned from um, in the first half of the 18th century. And he was the Hindu ruler of Ambar and Jaipur and served, um, uh, who served as a vassal to the Muslim Mughal emperor. So there's the connection back to the Muslim um, realm. Um, Jay Singh, although he was, you know, he really was covering his own territory, he built five large observatories throughout India and is known to have commissioned several astronomical manuscripts. So this came out on the market um, a few months ago. I have no idea who got it, but it would be really great if we could borrow it. So of course, no show on Islamic science can uh, occur without astrolabes. Um, I will have to learn exactly how they work and be able to talk about it um, at length and with ease. Um, my colleague did that a little bit uh, because he designed this case uh, at the British Museum, but I was able to include um, some important ones here. So uh, the one that we're looking at is actually uh, was made in Iran, the one on the left. Uh, so a 13th century astrolabe, one that was made in what's now Yemen, from the, uh, a little bit later, the same century, and a spherical astrolabe. Um, the one on the left was, was, we know who made it because it's been inscribed um, with his name. And it's the oldest, and we want to include it because it's the oldest complete gear device in the world. And it can be viewed in um, animation actually on the website of the Oxford um, History, Museum of History of Science. Um, so, and the, this will I think be shown later and you can get the inventory number if you want to take a look. That, that's, that museum has been very interesting because they have had exhibitions before where they've tried to put place all of these objects into a wider context with text, with paintings, with other objects. So um, I think, but other than that, there haven't, hasn't really been a, uh, an exhibition of this scale treating this topic. The, uh, and so this takes us to the second part of the exhibition, which is, there are three parts. The second part uh, is, uh, called Innovations and the Image. And this is really focusing on science as process. Um, and it will highlight some of these extraordinary uh, innovations in the history of Islamic science, technology, and mathematics, and explore um, their tremendous impact on visual culture through the ages um, to the present day. And much of that is also demonstrated through the current work of contemporary artists. And it will include revolutionary discoveries such as luster, which um, is represented, that story of luster is represented by um, a luster stained and painted and inscribed um, beaker that's in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and I worked on this as a research assistant at the Metropolitan Museum years ago with Stefano Carboni. And um, it was fantastic because depending on the kind of light you shine on it, um, the, the colors change. Uh, and, and well, the, you, they can't, you know, and, and so it just shows you different qualities that luster brings. Luster, I talked about the work on the right, which is ceramic, in my um, exhibition on, Suf, on Sufism at the Brooklyn Museum, um, and how these associations with um, the, the shine, the shimmering of luster also had these mystical connotations. Um, and, you know, these are, it's a, it's a speculation to say that something like this might, might um, elicit that, but, um, but, we, there are all these associations with light that, that would have been understood to the audience of, of the time, during the time it was produced. So 
um, I think what's important here is that with this, um, with the luster bowl, um, just the whole luster technique, it's first known from Iraq in the eighth and ninth centuries. And it's the inspiration for it may have come from luster stained glass that was produced in, um, in the Byzantine workshops of e in, in Egypt. So then there was this movement of potters who traveled with the secrets of their trade, um, and they may have played a role in the techniques transmission to another medium, uh, ceramics. So uh, when this, and this would have eventually a trans, uh, a trans was transmitted to Egypt, Iran, and Spain um, in the 11th and 12th centuries. So it goes sort of east to Iran and, and eventually goes over to Spain. Um, but, and then by the 15th century, um, the technique was practiced in Italy, where it underwent a revival um, in the 19th century, and eventually it reached uh, Britain, you know, the UK as well. And so we, at the British Museum, we had this whole case dedicated to this story of luster, and you see it through the ages. But luster, the luster technique, especially in the, in the medium of ceramic production in particular, is maybe one of the greatest contributions of Islamic science to the world. Um, and oh, sorry. And then also in terms of um, in, on glass, the application of luster would result in this dark stain. While on ceramic wares, the metallic pigments would create, depending on the the makeup of the um, the the second, you know, the oxide, the copper oxide, it would after second firing, you achieve this um, this shimmer. Um, and so the bowl on the left is from Egypt, late tenth, eleventh century, and the bowl on the right um, dates to the fourteenth um, century. So we also have some works from our collection that we'll be able to feature in the show. Um, marbling, the marbling technique is also another technology. You know, even the introduction of paper from China that goes back to, I mean, as far back as 8th century, but in 10th century, you see it, um, us move more to using paper as a medium. But marbling really happens um, in, in the um, Persian art world, and you see it a lot um, in, on Indian works, on Persian works, on um, Ottoman works as well. And then they appear in, Europe, in European objects as well, especially even the um, inner folds of a, of a manuscript of, of books. So um, beyond that, um, we'll, so we'll be able to show that with works that we have from our collection. I'm showing you two facing pages of an album. Um, and this is one of those cases where you, you can match album, an album page to one in another collection. Um, and so the one that we see, um, I should have made it a bit smaller to match the size of the other. One of them is in the Freer Gallery in DC and one is in our collection, the one at right. Um, the other part of this, the last part of this, you know, part two is the, there will be these intersections between theoretical, it gets a little bit nerdy at this point and some of the things are hard for me even to explain or understand, but there are these intersections between theoretical and practical knowledge. Um, and we'll look at those intersections by examining these varying levels at which science, philosophy, religion, and mysticism even engage with artistic concepts, processes, and techniques. And we'll look at the relationship between geometry and metaphysics and Islam and Sufism. Um, we'll look, look at questions of, about design and intent um, in applied mathematics um, and geometry. So looking actually also not at the designs that were then transferred into tile formations on buildings uh, and how you know, exploring whether the people who actually were building, doing the building, understood the mathematics, the very complex mathematics behind that. And in, the, and in some ways, I think we're learning that there was, they, there was much more knowledge there than we've given credit for. So it goes back to looking at makers of visual culture. Um, and then in the images that you see here, um, drawing attention to these extraordinary architectural innovations that are related to geometry or mathematics, such as the Mukarnas vault, an example of which, uh, one of the greatest examples of which is this, uh, the dome, the ceiling and the dome uh, chamber of a shrine, a 14th century shrine in Natanz, Iran, in central Iran, um, with, you know, which was started actually earlier um, in the century before, but really achieved its current state under um, in the 14th century. And so I put that there so that you could see the inspiration of that particular structure. That's it's basically these little shell, these shells formations. And these um, they almost look like these sort of stalactite or stalactite stalactite formations. So the, this very talented Iranian um, German artist Timo Nasri, um, who's based in Berlin. Um, was inspired by that to create this work on paper, which is in the collection of the British Museum. And 
he, um, he's really does these captivating explorations of Mokarnas, which is that distinctive architectural technique. Um, and it really fits into this idea of science as process. So this particular piece was executed in white ink on paper and it recreates this intricate geometric design. Um, and the earliest examples of which appear in 10th century architecture of Iran and North Africa. So he brings Mukarnas to life also in another installation um, called um, Florence Baghdad, which is inspired by Hans Belting's book, uh, Florence and Baghdad, Renaissance Art and Arab Science, which was published in 2011. And in this space, Nasseri Mokarnas designs are composed in this traditional Iranian mosaic um, mirror working technique known as Ainakari. And one of the artists best known for that is Munir Famon Famayan, who um, um, passed away recently, but, is, but her work hopefully will be included as well. And so that sort of takes us to all the way to the end of this section. Um, and there are many other examples of that. I mean, that you could sort of take that to many different levels, but I want to um, also have a chance to tell you about the last section, which is where I really feel um, there was an inspiration for this section specifically from um, something that came to my attention when I came to the museum and I was trying to put together the elephant, um, the elephant show. Um, and that was that I was thinking of all these different themes to show for a regular rotation of paintings. Um, and in the end, it became more exhibition like because I some, found all these elephant images. But in trying to pick out themes over time, I found out that a lot of times all the sort of finest examples of works had been shown or, dis, um, or uh, already exhibited. And so with works on paper, as, um, as many of you may know, but some may not, when they're light sensitive, they really require a, a great deal of rest. So a lot of times it's like a one, three ratio, you know, one month, three months, one, you know, one year, three years, or, and for, um, it's a little bit different at each institution, but for years, um, you know, we, we need to find a way to preserve this collection, this very um, valuable collection of, um, that Edwin Binney III um, donated in perpetuity. And I feel that my job as a curator is not only to share, to be, make these works known to today's audiences, but also to those who come, you know, after I'm long dead, hopefully in a better place. Um, so what I've done in this last section right now, I've sort of conceived it as um, a, an area where we can show the relationship between science um, and Islamic art framed within this context of conservation science and cultural preservation in the contemporary global museum. And, and here we can learn about different technologies used to assess and conserve Islamic art. Um, so we can, and we can learn a lot about object materiality. So, the objects in this section will highlight some of the scientific methods used to examine glass, metalwork, ceramics, and works on paper in the Islamic world, but they're also a way to think about works that are not from the Islamic world. Um, so one example of this is a, the study of this very well-known um, bowl from, um, that was made in the 12th century in Iran. And it was, um, we looked at it under ultraviolet X-ray and ultraviolet examination, and that's where you see all these pieces that were how it was all pieced together. And um, what we ended up doing was we removed any overpainting on the outside of the bowl, but not on the inside, and found out that um, you know this has been attributed to a very uh, a well-known potter. It has a date, um, and it looks like that's intact. But basically, it was a series of bowls, all of which were authentic, but pieced together to make a new bowl. Um, and then some overpainting to make it all work together on the top. Now, what I could have done was say, okay, let's take it apart, but it now has a life as this bowl. And I just felt it was important. So in the label, I talk about, um, about what, what it actually, um, yes, talk about that whole process. And then, uh, and then just say that, you know, there, you make these decisions case by case. And we'll also do this. Um, we have this great opportunity to work with um, the, Balboa Art um, Conservation Center um, at, um, in Balboa Park, the BACC, on a series of 10 to 12 works from works on paper. And we'll look at them in a number of different ways to see what we can learn about the way they're made um, and to use that as a way to talk to the public about the importance of conserving these works for the future. Um, and the idea is that you know, we, can, we might also look at um, fakes and forgeries and, and just look at this whole idea of the market, how the way these things are made um, and how look, conservation science can teach us more about the way things are made, the way the market works 
and hopefully um, encourage us to, um, to really promote ethical practices of display. So I think that brings us to the end, you know, and the last thing that I would just say is that in the process of looking at this, one of the artists that I've been thinking about including along with Haev Kakraman is, um, is based up in Northern California. Um, and we've been discussing um, ways that he's been inspired by the topic of this exhibition. And so, you know, in, in terms of other projects, like we're looking at and hopefully acquiring some new works, this is the type of um, artist who is very, very um, cerebral in his approach. He works a lot with historical texts. He's been inspired by the Persian poet um, Omar Khayyam um, and this particular work, um, which you can actually look up um, online as well, it's been featured um, already, is a series of um, night exposures of negatives taken from the Lick Observatory archives. Um, where the, and, they re, and the whole idea is that they reference the, the moon and night sky over the last 10 centuries through texts about the moon. Um, and so you can sometimes find these layers and sometimes you can't. So these are all windows looking at the moon and forming in, a, in the same way that the physician does this, this link and this bridge between the celestial um, and the terrestrial spheres that, um, where we exist. And, and he d does these, um, they're cyanotypes that are exposed by moonlight um, on these book pages that he's found. So there, it's possible he could do something like that, something to this um, effect you know, for us or do an installation. We're just sort of exploring ideas of, of um, moving forward. And that's what I love about this project. It has a lot of directions can go in. We do have one question. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A or drop them into the chat. I have both um, pop-ups open. So. Um, we do have one question, which is why do you consider lusterware technique the most important innovation of the period? I don't, um, well, I, do, I, I know I said it's probably one of the, um, because it was, it was because I was looking at it as an innovation that sort of crossed beyond, went beyond the Islamic world. So I think they're all, I mean, the mathematics, the architecture, these are all really, really important. But when you look at, um, maybe I should say one of, you know, um, to, be, to be more fair, but um, it's, it's because it had a tremendous impact on, on um, the pro ceramic production across the board um, in European works as well as Islamic. Um, and that's why, uh, that's why I wanted to draw attention to it and beyond Europe as well. But you know what, you're right. I really should, in a way I shouldn't make it the most <laughs> important. Um, I did say that very, with, with great emphasis, didn't I? <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> so exciting and I, I love the way that you're really taking um, art and kind of blowing it out to be um, visual objects instead of just works of art. I think it's really interesting to start thinking about when you're talking about the intersection of art and science, how that does sort of make it a broader category mm -hmm. to include more items. Yeah, and I think um, in some ways I, um... I feel like it, it gives you a, a wider picture and, um, you know, I should have probably included in my bio that, you know, one of my interests, especially after doing um, a couple of uh, reinstallations in museum collections is I, th I think a lot, one of my interests is very much focused on, um, on display in general, you know, and how, how we share information, how we present it. And, and I think, um, as much as is possible, it's, I'm, I try, I'm trying to, if I, cause there's no way that I could know every possible way of thinking about something, especially since much of that is also in the, in, in the body of the person who's, who's sort of received, looking at the object. So I think if, if we can just um, point out that there is a more holistic way of looking at an object or a work, then um, maybe we'll be able to get more out of it. You know, which has different layers, language, literature, music, you know, they're, they're all these also, you know, um, evoking other senses um, and other human senses. Um, and, if, and we don't have to you know, evoke those senses li literally in a gallery, but, but the fact that it would take you to that place um, just by virtue of, of engaging with that work, um, I, think, um, I think that's really fascinating. That, that's what really excites me about this material. I love it. Um, we have one more question. Well, sorry, we have two. Um, Karen followed up on her question about lusterware and saying, are you including etching? Is etching something you would include in the 
You mean the scratching in the glass? I mean, Karen, do you want to clarify? <laughs> While she's typing in, we have one other question, which is, do you know if and how the maps, diagrams, and tools were shared with the community in their place of origin? I think a lot of the works that we have are um, probably, uh, there. a lot of times they're ceremonial objects. Um, a lot of I think, you know, I would be interested in, uh, that's probably something that I'll look into more in terms of who were the audiences, who were the users of these, of these objects. Um, a lot, if, if they have an inscription, then you, you know, sometimes that tells you right away, or if they've been, um, they're dedicated to their, their owner, um, mm -hmm. or, the, or the maker has dedicated it to the owner. So sometimes it could be the case where instruments were made by somebody like Ibn Fernas in the ninth century for, the the ruler the mind ruler um but i don't um i don't know um i can't say for sure one interesting thing is that ibn Firnas um actually devised a flying machine so years before leonardo da vinci did and there have been attempts in the past to recreate that flying machine we don't have an image of it or any you know so it's based on the you know what he wrote about it um so um and i think you know um Blair anderson and her um, in her study of this, like it was, they had proposed to try and do this and they never ultimately did it, but it would be, it would be fun to do that as long as it, you know, doesn't become like totally kit you know, to sort of explore that in order to see if a, a contemporary artist would be interested in trying to devise some version of a flight machine um, that was inspired by the description of Ibn Firnas. That would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, Karen clarified, she said, I read that the process used in Rembrandt's etching was invented in Persia. Is that true? I cannot say for sure, Karen. I think I will have to, to see um, what you were, you know, to look at the reference. Because I don't, uh, yeah, because then now we're looking at, um, now we're looking at drawing, right? We're looking at works on paper. So I think I would have to see exactly what the reference is to. Sorry. To be, to be continued. <laughs> um, it looks like that's our last question. Okay. So thank you, Lydia. Thank you so much for being here, okay. sharing your work with us, giving us that sneak peek into what's planned for the future. I, that was, I'm so thrilled to see where this uh, exhibition goes. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks everyone who actually took the time, you know, right at dinner time and um, to, to listen in. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Thank you so much to our museum members for supporting the museum and for yes, being there. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you.